Welcome to the History Guy podcast, the podcast dedicated to stories of lesser-known historical events told by Lance Geiger, also known as the History Guy on YouTube. I'm Josh, your host, a writer for the channel, and eldest son of the History Guy. We tell all kinds of stories about history from the modern era to the ancient past, so you never know what we're going to talk about next. One thing you can be sure of, it is history that deserves to be remembered. This episode of Forgotten History is brought to you by Magellan TV, a new kind of streaming service that aims to bring you the best documentaries from around the world. On today's episode, we have two stories of the Cold War and just how close the world came to nuclear Armageddon. First is the story of Able Archer 83, a NATO exercise that simulated command procedures in the event of escalation, which the Soviets interpreted as preparation for a preemptive first strike. Then we will discuss Oleg Gordievsky, a KGB agent who defected to the West and who barely escaped death in one of the most complex agent exfiltrations in the Cold War. And now, the History Guy. National Geographic described the decade of the 1980s as a decadent, disastrous, and innovative time in American history, and it is somewhat difficult to explain to younger generations why we so enjoyed listening to Madonna on our Sonny Walkmans. Perhaps emblematic of the decade was the year 1983, when Star Wars Return of the Jedi was the number one film, and many of we original Star Wars fans wished that they had stopped there. In 1983, no one could not sing along with Bonnie Tyler's Total Eclipse of the Heart, and pretty much we still can't. In January, the Washington Redskins defeated the Miami Dolphins in Super Bowl 17, mercifully putting an end to the notorious strike season. And in October, the Baltimore Orioles defeated the Philadelphia Phillies four games to one in the World Series. And then in November, the world was nearly destroyed in nuclear Armageddon. Because while many of us did not realize it at the time, 1983 has been described by some historians as the single most dangerous year in human history. It's history that deserves to be remembered. During the 1970s, the Cold War saw a period of relative thaw called the Era of Détente. Détente was largely driven by the foreign policy of the Nixon administration and promoted by his Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, and Soviet Premier Leonid Brezhnev. Détente was characterized by a number of summits, agreements, and treaties in an overall attempt to reduce the risk of confrontation between the two superpowers. Detente certainly never eliminated the conflict, and the two still engaged in proxy wars and espionage. There's some disagreement over when the era of detente ended. Some say when Nixon left office in 1974, but others see the 1974 Vladivostok summit between President Ford and Brezhnev as a continuation of detente. And the framework of that meeting resulted in the SALT, or Strategic Arms Limitation Talks II agreement, signed between Brezhnev and President Jimmy Carter in June of 1979. In any case, the period of detente was certainly over when, six months after the SALT II agreement, the Soviet Union intervened to support the communist government in Afghanistan, precipitating the Soviet-Afghan War. In protest over what he described as an invasion, President Jimmy Carter called for a boycott of the 1980 Summer Olympics to be held in Moscow. And detente became just a distant memory. The same month, the Solidarity Union was formed at the Lenin Shipyard in Gdansk, Poland, a movement that would challenge communist rule in Poland. The Soviets in the West perceived these two events very differently. The U.S. and NATO allies in Europe saw the two movements as freedom movements and a rebellion against what they saw as serial violations of human rights in the Soviet Union. The Soviets, on the other hand, as described by then head of the KGB Yuri Andropov to KGB members in March 1981, saw the defense of communist regimes in Poland and Afghanistan as the justified struggle of nations for their national and social liberation against attempts at exporting counter-revolution. What Andropov described as Soviet military support for a justified struggle against Western counter-revolution, Carter called an invasion by a powerful atheistic government to subjugate an independent Islamic people, arguing that one lesson learned by the world at great cost is that aggression unopposed becomes a contagious disease. The U.S. and the West funneled money to both the Mujahideen opposition in Afghanistan and to the Solidarity Union in Poland. Cold War tensions grew more strained by changes in leadership. In May 1979, Margaret Thatcher became Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. She had come to power in part on a platform of opposition to the Soviet Union, arguing in a speech in January of that year that the Russians are bent on world dominance and they put guns before butter. She concluded 
They are a failure in human and economic terms. The following year, Ronald Reagan was elected President of the United States. Detente had deteriorated under Carter, but Reagan was more forceful in his opposition to the Soviets. In a famous speech in 1983, he referred to the Soviet Union as the evil empire and the focus of evil in the modern world. Both Thatcher and Reagan significantly increased defense spending, something that Yuri Andropov called imperialists waging an arms race on an unprecedented scale. And both East and West participated in that unprecedented arms race, with weapons both conventional and nuclear. In the Soviet Union, Leonid Brezhnev died in November 1982 and was succeeded by Andropov. Andropov was particularly distrustful of the West. Part of this was likely derived from his rise through the Soviet intelligence services, but historian Christopher Andrew notes the significance of Andropov's experience during the 1956 Hungarian uprising. Andropov was Soviet ambassador to Hungary at the time. He was said to be shocked at how quickly what seemed to be an all-powerful single-party state could collapse. Andropov was central to the Soviet decision to intervene militarily, playing a role that earned him the nickname the Butcher of Budapest. The experience, according to Andrew, left Andropov with what was called a Hungarian complex that had convinced them that military force was necessary to ensure the survival of the socialist revolution. This combination of leadership was dangerous, as Oleg Grudevsky, a KGB officer who defected to the West, noted it was a potentially lethal combination of Reaganite rhetoric and Soviet paranoia. One consequence was that Brezhnev and then Andropov became convinced that the United States was preparing for a nuclear war and was planning a first strike with the intent of decapitating Soviet leadership. The perception was enhanced by the fact that both Brezhnev and Andropov were old-fashioned Soviets and they believed in Soviet dogma, including the belief that Western capitalism was on the brink of failure and that Western nations would become more desperate and dangerous as it did. Beyond Hungarian complex, in 1979, NATO decided to deploy U.S.-made Pershing II intermediate-range nuclear missiles into West Germany. While NATO saw the Pershing as a response to the Soviet RSD-10, NATO designation SS-20, intermediate-range missiles, the Soviets saw the Pershing II as a first-strike weapon. The Pershing II was deployed from a mobile launcher, making it quick to deploy and difficult to target, and was designed to destroy hard targets like Soviet missile sites. The Soviets were afraid that the Pershing II could be deployed so quickly that the attack would not be detected until the Soviet return strike capability was destroyed. The deployment of the Pershing II was characteristic of the nature of the conflict and mistrust of the era. Both sides offered arms limitation solutions to deal with the tension over the missile's deployment. NATO offered a so-called zero option, where they would not deploy the Pershing II if the Soviets would dismantle their SS-20s. The Soviets, hoping to influence peace movements in the West, countered by offering to cap missile launchers at 300, including the existing 250 British and French nuclear weapons. The NATO offer was not acceptable to Moscow because it essentially required the Soviet Union to dismantle weapons that were already deployed in exchange for NATO weapons that didn't yet exist. The Soviet offer was not acceptable to NATO because it left them no counter to the Soviet SS-20s. Neither side budged, but both blamed the other. This was characteristic. In their rhetoric, both sides claimed they were still committed to detente, but blamed the other for threatening peace. The Soviets were also concerned with Reagan's support for the Strategic Defense Initiative, or SDI. In a speech to the nation in March 1983, Reagan said, I call upon the scientific community who gave us nuclear weapons to turn their great talents to the cause of mankind and world peace, to give us the means of rendering these nuclear weapons impotent and obsolete. SDI was intended to develop a ballistic missile defense weapon using advanced weapons concepts such as lasers and particle beams. Reagan saw the proposal as a means to free the world from the dangers of nuclear weapons, but the Soviets saw it as a method to protect the U.S. from retaliation, allowing a first strike. In 1981, Andropov, then still head of the KGB, announced to KGB agents the creation of Operation Ryan, which was an acronym for the Soviet words for nuclear missile strike. Operation Ryan was a directive for the KGB to covertly collect information regarding contingency plans for a U.S. nuclear first strike. This perception created a dangerous situation. Under the Reagan administration, the U.S. military was regularly testing Soviet defenses. U.S. bomber aircraft would fly to the edge of Soviet airspace and turn around at the last minute to test Soviet radar and response times. In April, the Navy participated in an exercise called Fleet X-83, the exercise included three U.S. carrier groups operating off the coast of the Aleutian Islands in the largest fleet exercise in the Pacific since the Second World War. 
In addition to the normal goals of practicing actions with integrated forces, Fleet X-83 had the mission to intentionally provoke the Soviet Union into responding so that the U.S. forces could study their response and tactics. The Navy saw Fleet X-83 as a great success. They did not realize that the Soviets were on a hair trigger anticipating a U.S. first strike. What the U.S. was seeing as a normal Cold War operation and even deterrence the Soviets in Operation Ryan were perceiving as a prelude to war. In 1983, more tensions were thrown into the atmosphere of distrust. On September 1st, Korean Airlines Flight 007 was flying from Anchorage, Alaska to Seoul, South Korea. An error in the autopilot system caused the plane to fly over restricted Soviet airspace. Soviet fighter interceptors, apparently mistaking the plane for a U.S. spy plane, shot down the commercial aircraft with air-to-air -air missiles. 269 passengers and crew were killed. Realizing the significance of their mistake, the Soviet Union at first denied all knowledge of what happened to the plane. The U.S., sensing a propaganda advantage, released classified intelligence and communication intercepts to implicate the Soviets. Once they finally admitted the action, the Soviets argued the plane was on a spying mission, but the U.S. was able to leverage the incident to shore up wavering Allied support for the deployment of the Pershing II. On October 25th, an internal conflict in the tiny Caribbean nation of Grenada, an island of just 135 square miles, became the next flashpoint. The island government had been overthrown by Marxist revolutionaries in 1979, and the United States saw an invitation to intervene by the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States as an opportunity to claim the island from Marxist rule. The resulting U.S. invasion involved more than 7,000 U.S. troops, and the U.S. is able to defeat local and Cuban forces in just four days, returning the island to democratic elections the following year. Public approval for the invasion in the U.S. was high, but the act was decried by the United Nations General Assembly. U.S. analysts concluded that the island was of little consequence to the Soviet Union, but that analysis was optimistic, as later evidence suggests that the Soviets feared the Grenada invasion was practiced for a larger exercise. Of even more concern, Operation Ryan analysts noticed that there was a large spike in ciphered communications between London and Washington, D.C. following the invasion of Grenada, a sign that they took as evidence of an impending nuclear attack. In fact, Andrew Garland of the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, notes that what these communications were were complaints from Margaret Thatcher and Queen Elizabeth II, who were furious that the United States had invaded a Commonwealth nation without either informing or involving the United Kingdom. With the Soviets increasingly convinced that the U.S. and the U.K. were preparing a nuclear first strike, and with the U.S. unaware of the extent of the Soviet concern, NATO was planning in November to simulate NATO procedures during a nuclear war. Able Archer was the name for an annual NATO exercise replicating the outbreak of hostilities in Europe. It was a command post exercise designed to test procedures more than actually moving troops. Able Archer 83 had been intended to be more robust than in recent years, in keeping with Reagan's goal of making exercises as real as possible as a means of preparation. But National Security Advisor Robert McFarlane realized that the action could be provocative and had limited the scope of the exercise. Still, the exercise simulated things like ciphered communication and command procedures as a conflict escalated from conventional to nuclear. These are exactly the sorts of things that Project Ryan was intended to detect. The Soviets began to suspect that Abel Archer was a cover to facilitate an actual first strike, assuming that the spike in ciphered communication after the invasion of Grenada represented planning for the attack. The U.S. and NATO remained oblivious. Despite several deviations from previous Abel Archer exercises, they did not perceive that the exercise could be perceived as a threat by the Soviets. Unaware of Project Ryan, the NATO exercise was mirroring exactly the scenario that the Soviets had assumed would lead to a preemptive nuclear strike. Convinced their only chance for survival was to strike before NATO could, the Soviet Union readied its nuclear arsenal for attack. While CIA intelligence noticed activity at Soviet air bases, the U.S. did not realize the extent of the Soviet response. That turns out to have been lucky, as U.S. commanders decided not to increase U.S. alert levels. Able Archer 83 ended on November 11th, with NATO apparently unaware that the exercise had brought the Soviets to the brink of nuclear attack. We still don't know exactly how serious the Russians took the threat or how close they came to launch. While intelligence assets at the time and documents that have been released since show us that the Soviets certainly took the activity far more seriously than we once realized, the general consensus is still that they didn't think an attack was imminent, that their finger was not really on the trigger, but some historians disagree, including Cold War historian and former CIA agent Dr. Peter Pry, who argues that had Abel Archer continued, 
even for as little as another 24 hours, that the West might have unwittingly stumbled into nuclear holocaust. To this day, we do not know how close the call was in the world's most dangerous year. But there are other historians that argue that this was the event that changed everything. Ronald Reagan was said to be very unnerved when he found out that the Soviets had taken the exercise seriously. It seems to be the first time that he realized that the Soviets so mistrusted us that they thought that we would do the unthinkable and start a nuclear war. He wrote in his memoirs, I became more anxious than ever to get a top Soviet leader alone in a room and try to convince him that we had no designs on the Soviet Union and Russians had nothing to fear from us. Reagan started 1984 with a softer tone, saying in an address on January 16th, Neither we nor the Soviet Union can wish away the differences between our two societies and our philosophies, but we should always remember that we do have common interests, and foremost among them is to avoid war and reduce the level of arms. Andropov died the following February, and Konstantin Chernyenko spent a year as general secretary. He was ill throughout and turned out to be only a brief caretaker. In 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev became general secretary. In Gorbachev, Reagan and Thatcher found a man with whom Thatcher said, we can do business together. In 1988, Reagan and Gorbachev signed the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, which among other things resulted in the decommissioning of both the Pershing II and the SS-20. By the end of the 1980s, the cassette playing Walkman had largely been replaced by the CD playing Discman. And Mr. Reagan had convinced Mr. Gorbachev to tear down the Berlin Wall. Now's the part of the episode where we get to sit down and chat with the history guy about what we just heard, what we're going to talk about later, and a little bit of behind-the-scenes stuff that you only get to hear about on the podcast. People born after the Cold War, like myself, uh, don't remember what it was really like during that time. But the tensions and the fear of a truly cataclysmic war were very real. What do you remember specifically about the time? You know, I think a generation before me, I, I was not in a time uh, when we did drills where you would hide under your desk. Uh, and I was not in a time when, uh, when they showed us uh, duck and cover in, in class. Uh, so I was in a time, though, where, I mean, I remember my school always had uh, civil defense stuff around. When, when I was in physics class, we could pull out the, the Geiger counters and the, uh, the radiation detectors and the, and the stuff like that was there in the school because it was, a, it was a, you know, a civil defense shelter. I think I came from the generation where that would become such a part of life that we didn't think about it as much. And I think if you look at, at people who were going to school maybe in the 50s, uh, there was more of a kind of a, an immediate red scare sort of threat. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, in my time, it was just kind of always assumed, mutual assured destruction, it was just kind of always assumed that the world could end one day. I mean, we just, it was, I, I, I don't think anybody questioned that it was, that it was possible. But still, it's amazing now to see how much was kept secret at the time, how much we didn't know about, say, nuclear accidents that were occurring. Or as the history guy now, and I get to go back and, and talk to people who were part of that, that were in the military at the time or whatever, it's surprising how much was hidden from us uh, in order to try to keep us from panicking. Because it seems like before that, the whole idea was to get people so scared about the Red Scare that it could justify a lot more defense spending and all that that was going on. Uh, but much of my early schooling was in the period of detente there in the 1970s when we thought things were thawing and thought things would be safer. I don't, I don't remember being scared of it, but I also, you know, I, I, I knew, I always knew. I mean, I, I grew up in South Dakota, you know, there were, there were missile silos every 10 feet in South Dakota. Yeah. Drive across the, they, they put them all over South Dakota because they figured if the, if the Russians nuked South Dakota, nobody would miss it. Uh, so, I, I mean, I always knew that there, was, that there was risk there. We were not too far from Ellsworth Air Force Base, which was a major base for, for the Bomber Command, uh, for the Strategic Air Command. But it, it, didn't, it didn't impact my life. I, and when we made the episodes, when we make episodes where we talk about it, we have some people who say to us, oh, that's crazy. We didn't worry about anything. And we have other people who say, no, I, you know, it scared me because, because they're literally giving advice like, uh, you know, cover yourself with the newspaper that will protect you from the blast or, Oof. you know, here's, you know, the, or, or they're doing drills where they're hiding in the, in the hallways. Uh, so I think different people had different expectations of it. I, and I think that my expectation of it was just something, it's something that didn't scare me. It was just part of life. Of course, I was born after everything. They'd already torn down the Berlin Wall. Um, so we, you know, we didn't have any of that for, I guess, for my generation, it's more the 9-11 and everything where we had all this, all this stuff happen. I mean, I very much remember that when I was at school, but it's interesting that, you know, you can look back and think, oh, you know, I was living life in 1983, like it was normal. And 
boy, <laughs> there were some people in 1983 who were playing a different game. Yeah, well, actually, I, and that's a point that we kind of make in the episode. I don't think in 1983 that I understood. Uh, I don't think almost anybody in America understood how close things came uh, with Abel Archer. I think we knew that tensions were up when Reagan came in and just didn't trust the Soviets, and it was a different tone. Uh, and of course, things changed after after Brezhnev died in the Granada invasion, which was which was almost covered comically at the time because it, the U.S. was attacking this little bitty island no one had ever heard of. No one really talked about that as being a a major point of escalation between the U.S. and the Soviets. And so I don't think that we that we realized at the time that things could have you know gone very differently. They didn't even release most of this information until quite a bit later. Even the people in charge didn't necessarily know what was happening or, or how serious it was. And now we can look back and we have the benefit of hide and sight. And that's, I mean, that's one of the benefits of history is for us to look at that so that maybe mm -hmm. we'll be able to interpret them with that, the, that the benefit. We'll Another lesson though is, because we've talked about other instances too, like the Norwegian rocket incident and things like that, that, that you know, tensions rose and it never turned into war. So maybe the whole idea of mutually assured destruction, maybe the idea that both sides mistrusted the other, but knew that they wouldn't start a war. Maybe it was, we were never that close to war. Maybe we, we've overstated that because we had all these instances where there was all sorts of mistrust going on and it never seemed to escalate anything, anything close to, you know, actually pushing the button. Uh, yeah. You know, assuming that if those those missiles that have been sitting in those silos all those years would actually take, they might, you know, just be rusting now. I mean, you might push <laughs> a button and they laugh at you, but I, it's hard to say. Is the lesson that we were really close to war? Is the lesson really that we really wouldn't go to war? And it's hard to say today, you know, are we closer to the trigger than they're saying or are we farther away? I mean, really all that we can say is that when you look at history, uh, these events were more dramatic than we realized them to be at the time. So that tells us something about now. Maybe, you know, things are more dramatic than we realize today, or maybe we're being more dramatic talking about today when actually we've lived through much worse in the past. That's e fair. E either way, it's history that deserves to be remembered. Because it, it does make you wonder, you know, could it could it happen again? And I, I mean, I think the answer is yes. Well, I, we'll prob we probably won't know. There could be something going on even fairly recently that T yeah. 20 years from now we're like ah this was this was the closest <laughs> and, yeah we and had we had we had no idea uh in 1979 with that computer glitch we had no idea how close we were coming to to war at the time so who knows i mean last night there could have been something that happened and we might not find out yeah. about it for another 20 years one of the lessons you can take from this history this relatively recent history of the cold war is that all the governments involved uh, still protect those secrets to the extent that you don't really know what happened until years after it happened. Yeah. And so I, that's another interesting lesson to learn is there's certainly a bail over a lot of stuff that's going on. And so we might, uh, there might be more dramatic things going on than we realize. And we might not even know, it might be our children that find out what was going on. You know, my kid will be asking me, well, how, how what was it like in, in 2020 when when they nearly blew up the world with all the nukes or something again? And I, it's, you just yeah. don't know. We don't know. We were playing. We were playing video games. So I was yeah. around there in in '86. I didn't didn't change me. I didn't wake up. You know, I, I didn't I didn't realize anything special was going on. But it was. Why Why do you think that the Cold War has remained so prominent in the public mind, especially when we talk about uh, our channel? I mean, a, a, a huge chunk of our channel were around for the Cold War. I mean, I grew up during the Cold War. It was the it was the thing that we talked about. So I, your generation probably is more familiar with the global war on terror. I mean, since since 2001, you know, things have been, or, or since 9-11, things have been just very different in terms of what we perceive as being our enemy. So I think a chunk of it is just because that's, you know, that was the conflict that we grew up with. But I, I think, uh, you know, obviously still there's a lot of tension between us and Russia, and there's a lot of tension between East and West, and now there's a lot of tension also with China. I mean, those are reminiscent of things that have been going on for, for decades at a time. The generations that are alive today, you have to go back almost two generations from me before you have people who really think of, you know, the, the you know, Hitler as being their enemy, yeah. you know, who remember the Second World War. Really, the people that are alive today, what they remember is growing up during the Cold War, and that was the great tension of the, of the time. And so even if that's changed, even our vision of the world has changed, I mean, that's kind of what's grown into our foundation and it's kind of stuck in our DNA there as, as being something to think about. We talk a lot about all sorts of periods of history on this channel. I mean, the World War II is really interesting to talk about. Uh, but since the development of nuclear missiles, you know, you really don't think that that's what war is going to look like. The world is so different uh, when, when uh, a war that can be as destructive as the Second World War could occur in, in, in a matter of minutes.
Yeah. And, and I think that that is going to sit with your psyche. Everything you're doing, everything you're thinking, everything that's important to you today uh, could be gone in a moment. We've talked about like say military forts and stuff like that in, in the channel. And it's really interesting to talk about deterrence. I mean, if you think about how much money, how much treasure the world has spent on building these weapons that we hope we never use, and we'll never know if we never used them because we built them. And so it's, I mean, there's just, it's, it's intriguing. It's a, it's a piece of history. There was never a point where George Washington was going to destroy the earth. No. And now, now, you know, that's the, so, so I mean, it does seem possible. Before, I mean, the, all the things that the Romans did and could do, uh, you know, we could do, <laughs> yeah, we, we could do a hundred times that with one submarine. And so it really does, you know, put the rest of history into perspective. Magellan TV is sponsoring this episode, and like always, we have continued to watch Magellan TV just to learn new things. What have you been watching on Magellan TV lately? Uh, you know, a really interesting one that we really uh, recently watched was the story of, of Frankel. The name of the episode is Frankel the Super Horse. So I think Frankel, because he was a, it was a British racing horse, I think he's probably better known in Europe than he is in the United States. In the, in the documentary, they say he's the most famous racehorse in history. Uh, whereas, you know, we tend to look at our triple cat crown winners, but truly an exceptional racehorse. But this wasn't just a, like a sports history. It really talked about uh, this relationship that he had with an ex extraordinary horse trainer uh, named Sir Henry Cecil. And it was just, it was fascinating the way they tied the two together and they tied the career together. So it's, it's, it's fascinating. It's another one of those examples how you can find anything on Magellan TV. It's, it's very history guy-ish because it's a, it's a kind of forgotten piece of niche history that was really fascinating in the storyline. It's made by documentary makers and they're looking for the, the best documentaries and they get stuff on here that is that. So if you like what we do on the channel, you'll likely like a lot of what's on Magellan. It's not just history stuff. You were just talking about sports history. What One of the things I was watching lately was it is called Hubble's Universe. And they're actually just really, really short little snippets about various things essentially that Hubble has helped discover. And so like the first episode is about uh, the structure of dark matter. It talks about how they, using Einstein's theory of relativity and gravitational lensing, that you can you can see the structures of these things and it's it really talks about the whole structure of the universe and so you can you can go from hearing about these stories of a, a really interesting racehorse to totally looking at like cosmology and how what the universe is and our our place in it and that's i mean that's one of the great things about magellan tv there's always something to watch no matter what mood you're in and as always we have got a special offer for history guy viewers and listeners if you go to try.magellantv dot com slash the history guy there is always going to be an awesome offer up there i think right now you're getting a percentage off an annual membership try dot magellan tv dot com slash history guy coming up the history guy tells the story of oleg gordievsky a kgb agent who defected to the west at great cost to himself and stay tuned after the episode to hear us talk some more with the history guy Spy stories are a favorite for many because there are elements of mystery, intrigue, adventure, and romance. Cunning villains, fast vehicles, big explosions, it makes for a great story and often an even better movie. Real life, as we all know, is often far different than the Hollywood version. In real life, there may be far fewer gadgets and high-speed crashes, but the stakes are higher and the impact of their work is sometimes beyond measure. Whether you know his name or not, Oleg Gordievsky is one of those real-life spies, and his time as a Cold War spy is history that deserves to be remembered. Oleg Gordievsky was born the second of three children to Anton Gordievsky, an officer in the KGB in Moscow in 1938. While he was baptized by his grandmother, an act that was banned in the Soviet Union at the time, his childhood would give no indication that he would be anything other than a loyal citizen and faithful communist. He was accepted into the prestigious Institute of International Relations. Oleg had an interest in Western culture and was pleased when one of his first small tasks for the KGB was in Eastern Germany, where he witnessed the raising of the Berlin Wall. First he worked in Moscow, doing the paper-pushing work of creating documents for KGB spies. Soon he was appointed to a position in Copenhagen, where he had a more active role in intelligence gathering. Oleg may have looked like a cookie-cutter KGB agent to his employer and fellow countrymen, but he actually had grave concerns about how the communists maintained their control and had a soft spot for Western culture. He enjoyed music and literature, and his time in Denmark allowed him to explore a wide range of cultural activities he could not access in Moscow, 
Even as he worked for the Soviets, he saw the freedoms allowed the Danish citizens and recognized that the quality of life was better in Denmark than in Moscow. Oleg had also found love in Copenhagen in the form of Leila Alieva, another KGB agent. He was already married to a different KGB agent, uh, married made more for career benefits than love. He was essentially leading two intertwined but parallel lives. He was working for the KGB, but harbored sympathies for the West. He was living in a loveless marriage, but carving out time for an affair. The perfect setup for a midlife crisis. But Gordievsky's midlife crisis went undetected by his family and employer. Oleg had realized he wanted to make his work count, and the best way he could think to do that was to become a spy for the United Kingdom. In Oleg's case, becoming a spy was more of an internal drama than an external one. He dropped hands, and eventually the British MI6 stationed in Denmark realized he was potentially a source of valuable information. There were semi-clandestine meetings between Oleg and Richard Bromheld, the senior MI6 officer in Copenhagen. Both men told their superiors they were meeting and reported back on the interaction. Oleg told his boss that the source was a dead end. Bromhead told a very different story. He was now warily optimistic. Over the next three years, Oleg's life was everything spy work is, and movies are not. Oleg kept doing his job, creating reports, following directives from Moscow, playing office politics, and seeing his mistress. He certainly took precautions to avoid detection by both the KGB and his wife, and he did have some tense moments, but most of his spy work was meetings and reports, both in the office and in the safe house, where he had met with his handlers. His steady work paid off. Oleg climbed the ranks, first in Copenhagen and then in Moscow, where he was recalled, as is typical of agents serving in the West. Going back to Russia was a risk, but it was the only way to get ahead. The British MI6 team put together an incredibly complex, long-shot plan in case he needed to sneak out of the country. He divorced his first wife and married Layla and continued working. After learning English and jockeying for a coveted position, he was stationed in Britain, quite the coup for the team at MI6 who would now have home field advantage with a practice spy. When he arrived in London, however, he was not well liked by his boss or the colonel in charge, and he had trouble coming up with the sources and information needed to make a good first impression. They pulled together enough confidential but useless information, or chicken feed, for Oleg to earn the respect of his colleagues as an asset. This, in turn, gave him access to more important insights and information on the international spies working for the KGB and Soviet leadership, which he handed over to British intelligence. Eventually, these reports made their way to the Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, and allied intelligence agencies, including the CIA. Oleg's reports on the inner workings of the KGB were essential to Britain's understanding of the Cold War and how the Soviets interpreted the West's actions. Possibly his most significant contribution was his information regarding the Soviets' interpretation of Abel Archer, which influenced the decision to work on de-escalation. Unfortunately, the Soviet Union had its own rising star. Aldrich Ames was a discontented CIA agent in counterintelligence, with just enough information to be valuable and dangerous. He was also one of a small number of intelligence agents who knew of Oleg's existence. He only knew of Oleg by a code name, but he had seen just enough reports from MI6 that he could tip off the KGB of a double agent. Without firm evidence, Moscow started hunting for the traitor in their midst, and Oleg was on the short list. Since Oleg was transitioning into the lead of the British KGB office, he was not shocked to get a call from the Home Office in Moscow, directing him to return for important meetings. But there were a few things off about the call. He had 48 hours to decide whether to defect or to continue on. His handlers and MI6 tried to remain neutral. They knew if he was outed while in Russia, he would be killed. But there was no proof that he had been compromised, and Oleg was about to be in the best possible position to assist them. When Oleg decided that it was worth the risk to make the trip to Moscow, they dusted off the extraction plan that was made all those years ago. The one that would ultimately save his life. The plan went like this. If Oleg needed to leave the country, he would have to contact MI6 without alerting anyone. This could be done on a Tuesday evening at 7.30 p.m. by standing outside a designated bread shop with a plastic Safeway bag, dressed in gray with a gray cap. The bag had a large red S on it, which would stand out but not draw attention as plastic bags were often reused. When the MI6 officer spotted Gordievsky, they would walk by carrying a green Harrods bag, eating either a Kit Kat or a Mars bar. The MI6 agent would also be wearing something gray, would make eye contact but not stop walking, and this would trigger the next step. 
The British needed to get permission to take a diplomatic trip out of the country. This required two days for the paperwork to be submitted and approved, and special license plates to be acquired from a garage that was only open on Wednesday and Friday. By starting the process on Tuesday night, MI6 could have all the proper documentation in place by 1 p.m. on Friday, and their team could head to the rendezvous site on the Russian border with Finland by 2.30 p.m. on Saturday. The rendezvous spot was a turnout 36 miles from the border that was wooded so Gordievsky could climb into the trunk of the car and be driven in secret across the border. On the Friday that the diplomatic car was being secured, Gordievsky would be making a long roundabout trip to the rendezvous site by taking a train to Leningrad a taxi to cut another train to Zelenogorsk, and then a bus to the Finnish border, exiting near the rendezvous site and hiding until the car arrived. Assuming the Russians respected the diplomatic designation of the car, the British would drive Oleg through multiple checkpoints while he was tranquilized in the trunk. Once in Finland, they would drive north through the entire country into Norway, up to the Arctic Circle, and then board a plane to Oslo and through to London. The plan was a long shot at best, but Oleg headed to Russia with the plan fresh in his head and hoped that he would not need to use it for himself or his family. The British started monitoring the bread shop for the first communication every day using a team of four, British diplomats Arthur G., Roy Ascot, and their wives. They were also under constant surveillance and went to great lengths to make excuses to walk by the bread shop without creating a pattern that could be detected. Oleg had been told to leave his wife and two daughters in London, so he headed to their Moscow apartment alone. As soon as he arrived, he knew that he was under surveillance. The apartment had a new deadbolt that he did not have a key for, but it was locked, a sign that his apartment had been bugged and possibly coated in radioactive dust, which the KGB used as an undetectable tracking system. He went to the office as requested, and his meetings were dicey, but he wasn't thrown in jail or tortured. At one point he was drugged, but he managed to keep enough of his wits about him to deny betraying his country. The KGB brought his family back to Moscow to use as unacknowledged hostages. Oleg lived in fear, knowing that he was suspected, but not yet charged. He was drinking heavily for the first time in his life. His family and friends were extremely worried that he was cracking under the stress at work and that he was on the verge of a mental breakdown or even suicide. After much anguish, he determined that he could not tell his wife that it would be safest for all of them if his family stayed behind while he fled the country. He and Layla decided she and the children would go to visit her family while he stayed behind. On Tuesday, July 16, 1985, Oleg started the process of putting the intricate escape plan into action. It would take more than luck for each signal to go correctly and for Gordievsky and the British agents to evade their surveillance long enough to rendezvous. Due to internal politics, Oleg's department at the KGB had chosen to monitor his movements using a less skilled surveillance team to avoid tipping off other departments. Gordievsky spent several hours darting on and off public transportation through stores and apartment buildings to lose any tails and it seemed to have worked by the time he arrived at the bread shop. It happened to be Arthur G.'s night to monitor the bread shop, and he was running late. There seemed to be more people, including potential surveillance, than usual. G. passed by in his car and saw Gordievsky, in his gray and with the telltale bag, and as quick as he could parked at home, told his wife he had to get bread, and headed out with his Herod's bag and a Mars bar. When he got back to the bread shop, G. thought he must have been mistaken. The man in gray was gone, but he got in line for bread anyway, and then took one last look as he rendered the street. He saw Gordievsky across the street, tucked into a doorway. G moved through the motions for the next signal, pulling out his green Herod's bag, walking down the street, and taking a bite of his Mars bar in order to make the briefest of eye contact while continuing on his stroll. And both men were certain that the escape plan was now in motion. While the British team in London began moving into place in Finland, Gordievsky started planning to leave while still accepting invitation for dinners with friends and family the next week and G and Ascot created a completely imaginary medical issue to take them to Finland the coming weekend. Arthur G's wife, Rachel, suddenly had an excruciating backache that they determined needed medical attention from a specialist in Helsinki. She started commenting and complaining to Arthur and the Ascots about how terrible it was, and soon the couples had decided to make a weekend of it, along with the Ascots' baby daughter. All these plans were made out loud. They were certain their living quarters were bugged. It was a tense week. Gordievsky was concerned he would be detained before ditching his surveillance on Friday to take the train out of town. Ascot and G barely received the essential diplomatic license plates in time. The team in Britain needed Prime Minister Thatcher's approval to move forward with the plan, but she was on her annual trip to Balmoral with the Queen. Yet each detail ultimately fell into place, like a perfectly positioned chain of falling dominoes. On his trip, Gordievsky was certain he would be discovered. Fellow travelers all seemed suspicious, and he had to make a bit of a scene feigning sickness to get off the bus close to the rendezvous point, but as average citizens, they must have been much less inclined to imagine a spy in their midst than he was. 
In fact, Olga arrived at the designated turnout point hours early and had time to go into the closest town for a meal and a beer. His rescuers, on the other hand, were focused on finding a way to outwit the Russian surveillance vehicles that had been following them from the start of the journey. It took race car type driving just before the rendezvous point in order to turn off the road and get behind the cover of the trees with a few seconds to spare before the Russians passed them, thinking the British cars had already rounded the next curve in the road. Oleg surprised the British by jumping out from the bushes without waiting for a signal, but they confirmed it was him and got him into the trunk with little fanfare. They were back on the road in less than two minutes. When they passed the surveillance cars they'd pulled over to try to figure out where they'd gone, the Russians quickly picked up their tail again, but never figured out what they had done. There were still obstacles between Gordievsky and his freedom, but the British agents were both calm and resourceful. They were prepared for the five border checks, three Soviet and two Finnish, and knew the procedures. At one, the men were filling out paperwork, while the women casually guarded the cars with both a fugitive spy in the trunk and a fussy baby in their arms when Border Patrol came close with search dogs. To distract and deflect the dogs, they dropped some of the flavored chips they were eating and then changed the baby's conveniently dirty diaper on the hood of the trunk, which was smelly enough to keep the patrol from coming any closer. That border stop ended up being the last dicey moment of the rescue, and on Monday night Oleg was on British soil, where he has been closely guarded ever since. Gordievsky's work was not done even after he formally defected. Information that he had collected continued to be useful for years to follow, and his understanding of the communist regime guided the West as they came to the end of the Cold War. While Aldrich Ames has generally been considered the source that led to Oleg's outing, later examination has brought that into question, leaving open exactly who betrayed Gordievsky and his fellow spies. Gordievsky was sentenced to death in absentia by the KGB, a sentence that has not been carried out despite several attempts, including a poisoning attempt in 2008. Oleg was reunited with his family in 1991, but the damage to his marriage was too great and it crumbled soon after. He did receive gratitude and accolades from Britain and America. In 2007, he was appointed Companion of the Most Distinguished Order of St. Michael and St. George, an award that was also awarded to a fictional spy that you might recognize, James Bond. Oleg Gordievsky's actions were brave, but how important do you think they were ultimately in affecting the course of history? It's hard to say, like it's hard to say whether nuclear bombs prevented nuclear war, but I think potentially very important, and that's what we talk about in Able Archer 83, is that at the time it's very clear, and of course things are, you know, Reagan was a very different president uh, than anybody who came before him in terms of his relations with the Soviets. Uh, but certainly the Soviet Union was so very different after Brezhnev passed and we went through the Chernyanko and the Andropov period. It's very clear that we did not understand each other at that time in a way that moved fingers much closer to the button. And so the place where he was so critical was in giving us a better understanding of what the Soviet psyche was in a way that was less likely or made it less likely that there would be a mis calculation. And so, I mean, it might not be what you'd expect from a, you know, a, a, a double agent who's betraying Russia that what he really did is he, he showed us that Russia was not the threat that we thought it was, showed us uh, a better way to respond to Russia in a way that was less likely to escalate. So it's possible uh, that he's one of the most important people in history. It's possible that his central role in understanding the Soviet response to Abel Archer 83 prevented nuclear war. Uh, and and if that's true, I mean, he's, you know, who, who's more important in history, right? Uh, and the thing is, we'll never know for sure, because it's a what if, if we hadn't. So I, I would like to think that it was really, really important, uh, because, uh, uh, you know, we'll never know if it was or if it wasn't. But I mean, it, it's better than the alternative. It's interesting, because it's, it's such an exciting story, uh, all his whole, all of his escapes and his near death experiences. But it's also in some ways, you know, more low key than our action sequences of James Bond. <laughs> his he had he had some close calls and some crazy stuff, but he wasn't involved in crazy shootouts and stuff like that. But he still it is interesting when you think about that his his contribution was so important, and that it didn't have to do with him, you know, passing the plans for Soviet world domination. And just simply was that we had two cultures that were so opposed to one another. And honestly, I mean, the prop had bought into our own propaganda of both sides that we, we mm -hmm. both had decided that the other side was the, the most evil and was going to was willing to do the things that, you know, I think at the very least, the Americans certainly didn't think that we would ever preemptively strike. And I think the Russians from from the story, you kind of find out that they didn't really intend to do that either until they thought maybe we were going to. And so, you know, our fears were more dangerous than, than the realities. And Oleg really 
represents that. Yeah. Both both sides were misjudging what the other's intent was, is, is the most we can say, without trying to take any sort of sides yeah. in the Cold War, how we saw things. And so it is interesting because both the spy craft, the method that they got him out when they were all under surveillance, it, which is in many ways so much more interesting than just a car chase, you know, the, yeah. the, with a bunch of stunts in it. In a, in a spy thriller, uh, what's at stake is always something that's so immediate. But I mean, really what's at stake, what they were sharing with information here is actually just, it's a much deeper story than, oh, someone's got a tape that has all our agent's name on it or something like that, that you're going to get out of a regular spy story. So yeah. it is a, it is a truth is stranger than fiction sort of story. It's a really a more compelling story uh, than, you know, the sort of popcorn movies that we tend to get out of spy thrillers. And the, what you understand a spy to be is so different than what a, a spy really is and what a spy can really do. He's not a James Bond type at all. He, he never no. did the sort of things that James Bond, he never had a license to kill. And as far as I know, it didn't even appear that he probably was armed, but he wasn't an undercover sort of agent. And yet what he was able to do was so much more powerful. Ian Fleming, that was kind of flowing out of the Second World War. And it was, you know, you, you had a different vision of, you know, ops and stuff like that. And yeah. We do, you know, we learn some, some, crazy things, you know, that, that we've done that, you know, we were studying one where the CIA tried to train a cat to <laughs> bug people and they just found out you can't train a cat. No, uh, yeah, so, I mean, work. there's, there's a lot of crazy stuff that went on in the cold war, but when you get to the reality of the stuff that really made the difference, it's not at all what we've been portrayed to be, but in, in, in many ways, it's just a really a more interesting and more powerful story. And I think that that leads pretty well into the question of what can we take from Oleg's example? As And I'm sure that, I mean, clearly there are differing perspectives. I don't think the Soviets would have been so kind to him that, uh, as we no, would on the, on the Western they're, side. They're, they're likely still trying to kill him for what he did, or at least that's the, you know, the kind of current story about it. And, yeah. Well, I, you know, I think he is an example of someone who was trying to do the right thing and willing to put himself at risk to do the right thing. Uh, because what he really believed was right. And, uh, you know, I can see certainly why the Soviets see him as a traitor. I mean, he was a double agent for all those years, but it doesn't seem like his goal was really to destroy his Soviet masters or anything like that, that his his goal was to was to try to deal with this tension between these two cultures in a way that was less likely to kill everybody. So that is, I mean, that's a powerful lesson to learn. I, I You know, every every hero's a villain to somebody else. It's kind of hard to say, but I mean, it is to say that he, uh, you know, the lesson to take there is that it's, if you go to do the right thing and you're willing to do risk from that, you can have a huge impact uh, and maybe a much larger impact than he would ever have had if he was just, you know, a regular KGB agent. It would certainly, no one would remember his name. So I'm certainly not suggesting that anybody betray their country or become a double agent or anything like yeah, that. But, but I'm right, saying that but... even people that are in these these positions where they're, I mean, they're, where they're these very patriotic positions uh, might have an ability to see that the, that what's right might not exactly match what you're being told and can actually do the right thing at the right time and maybe make a difference. He's certainly a hero. He's extraordinarily brave. Even if he's not a hero to everyone. And that's, I mean, maybe that's part of the lesson is that in real life, it's not always so simple as a hero and a villain, but mixed Absolutely, stuff. Yeah. But at least, I mean, what he did, you can say now was significant. And I think in general, good for the world. No matter, no matter how you put it, uh, he risked his life trying to protect the life of others, or at least as he saw it. If, if it had been, you know, the other way around, we might think of him as a great villain, but I wouldn't change that, that he was doing what he thought was right. And he was willing to take risks to do that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the History Guy podcast. We hope you enjoyed these stories of forgotten history, and if you did, you can find more on our YouTube channel at The History Guy, History Deserves to be Remembered. We will continue to release podcasts every other week, so stick around if you want more podcasts on forgotten history. You can also find us on our website, thehistoryguy.net, as well as on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Rumble, and Patreon. You can even get a personalized message from the History Guy himself on Cameo.